Ira, welcome into the game here in Tuscaloosa. I hope you're doing well. I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Well, now, now you got to be honest with us. Is this your first Florida State Alabama preview uh, as we look of, look for 186 days away from that game? No, I, you know I was covering FSU back in 2007 when they played. Um, so uh, I think that was Coach Saban's first year, and Jimbo was an assistant under Bobby Bowden, and uh, it's kind of amazing how far Alabama's program has come uh, in those ten years. No doubt, no doubt. I mean, we, we, we certainly want to talk about the upcoming game, but really wanted to get a spring uh, sort of thoughts on Florida State. First off, when do they start spring practice there? They'll actually be starting next week. Okay. Uh, I think on the 6th, which is Monday. Uh, that'll be the first day. And they'll, they'll. it's kind of a weird schedule this year because spring break falls the following week. So they're going to practice for a week, take a week off, and then uh, have the final few weeks of spring practice. And the spring uh, game, I think, is April the 8th. Am I right? Correct. Yeah. All right, what are the biggest question marks going into the spring for Florida State? Uh, you know, mostly on offense. Uh, you know, they, they bring back DeAndre Francois uh, at quarterback, and they bring back, uh, you know, some some individual players on offense that they're real excited about. Uh, Nyquan Murray is a young receiver they're excited about. Uh, Auden Tate also, uh, they're excited about, you know, some of the young offensive linemen. Uh, but there's a lot of, veterans that they have to replace you know obviously Dalvin Cook at running back is a huge uh you know departure so they're gonna have to fill that position they like what they have there they've got a bunch of you know five-star guys that um you know highly talented highly touted highly recruited uh prospects at that position one of them uh kind of the incumbent is a Jacquez Patrick who is a junior who was a five-star guy a couple years ago and has sat behind Dalvin Cook but has gotten some opportunities to, to play when Dalvin was hurt um He'd be the leader for the job, but they also signed a five-star kid out of Mississippi, Cam Akers, who's a um, you know who's who's already enrolled. He enrolled in January, so he'll be competing there. I think it'll be tough. I think his his ceiling's probably higher of the two, but uh, you know when it comes to pass protection and all those types of things, I think it would be hard to ask him to play right away. But um, you know, kind of what they do at the running back situation, uh, you know, they the offensive line. It's it's mostly a question of kind of who steps up where. They have more depth on the offensive line than they've had in a long time, uh, but there's there's a lot of battles, and there's a couple guys out for the spring, so I think it's going to be a lot of mixing and matching on the offensive line. When you look at that defense right now, they were ranked uh, right outside the top 20. I think at 22, according to total defense, we look at yards per game, if that's the metric uh, we want to use. They return 9 out of the 11. Am I correct on that? 9 out of the 11 on the defensive side of the football? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. De- you know, defensively, they should be very solid. Um, you know, last year was a weird year for them. You know, as you said, at the end of the year, if you looked at their stats in the in the composite, it looks pretty good. But it was almost the tale of two seasons. You know, the first half of the season, uh, they really struggled. Ole Miss lit them up. Uh, you know, obviously Louisville lit them up, scored 63 points. North Carolina lit them up. Uh, USF put a lot of points on them. I mean, really, everybody they played in the first half of the season – had big games against them. They really settled down in the second half of the season. Uh, you know, they, some of the guys that had to step up due to injuries, you know, they lost Derwin James, who was a preseason All-American, to an injury at safety. Uh, so they had a young guy replacing him. And they had a couple of other uh, new starters that really struggled in new roles. Uh, but in the second half of the season, when, once they started playing, uh, first, I think they kind of found themselves a little bit. And then they also started playing some offenses that were not as dynamic. They really kind of turned it around, and they were they were pretty dominant in the second half of the season. Really, even the Michigan game, even though the final score in the Orange Bowl wasn't doesn't look like they played a great defensive game, they really did. Michigan scored uh, most of their points off of either turnovers or uh, special teams. So, within the strength on the on the defense, you think it's secondary, linebacker, defensive line out of those three units? Uh, I'd say defensive line and uh, secondary. Uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, it's 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 kind of one of those things where on the defensive line they do lose their best player. Demarcus Walker had 16 sacks last year, uh, you know, 10 sacks the year before. He's really been the kind of leader of that defensive line the last two years. He's leaving, so so that's a big loss. But you bring back uh, both your starting defensive tackles, Derek Noddy and, De- and Demarcus Christmas, uh, who who had pretty solid years, especially the second half of the year. You bring back Josh Sweat, who was a huge recruit. Some people thought was the number one player in the country uh, coming out of high school until he blew out his knee as a senior in high school. He's coming into his, uh, his junior year. They expect big things out of him. 
Uh, and then they have a you know a freshman defense. Uh, well, he'll be a sophomore this year. Defensive end Brian Burns, who had nine and a half sacks last year, is just a pass rushing specialist. Um, so I think that defensive line they've got a lot of depth there. I think they, that defensive line is probably the strength. But but then you look at the secondary. If Derwin James you get him back, uh, you know he's you know I think some people think one, he'll be one of the highest picks in the NFL draft next year. Uh, Tavares McFadden, uh, you know, led the country in interceptions for most of the year. A cornerback. Uh, you also bring back a couple other veterans, Nate Andrews, who's a guy from Alabama who's coming back for his fifth year. Uh, and you have you know just a lot of guys who like Trey Marshall who will be a senior. They just have a lot of experience in that secondary. Do you think this game will live up to hype? I know we're 186 days away, but, I mean, we're, we had a guy on about 30 minutes ago that talked about uh, he thinks this could be one against two. He said, you look at Ohio State, Florida State, Alabama. He said, you could draw them out of a bag and put them as the number one team in college football. You think this game may live up to the hype? I mean, will we get this one and two type showdown? I think it is going to be, you know, I think it's going to be something like that. Top two or top three teams, uh, you know, two of the top three or, or, or number one, number two. I think there is going to be a lot of hype about Florida State, mostly because of that defense. Um, but it's going to be a big test for FSU because they do have a lot of pieces to replace on offense. I'm a little bit concerned about FSU's offense. Just looking at, you know, Dalvin Cook leaving early for the NFL at running back. Rod Johnson, the left tackle, left early for the NFL. Travis Rudolph, their top receiver for the last two years, left early for the NFL. Uh, I just think, and I really like DeAndre Francois, their quarterback. Um, but I just, I wonder if that that's going to be a tough ask for FSU in the first game of the year. So I, I don't know if the game itself is going to live up to it. I think Florida State's going to have a tough time uh, scoring a lot of points in that game. But I do think the buildup is going to be huge. I know FSU fans, they, they, the administration, you know, they wish they – the uh, FSU's president told me if they could get 100,000 tickets just for FSU, he thinks they could sell them all. Oh, I believe it. I mean, it, it's, I mean it's just – it's going to be fun to, to sort of talk about this as we lead up. We're talking to Irish Showfield right now, warchant.com is the website affiliation with rivals.com. And we're talking about Florida state and, and talking some college football. As we look at the LSU vacancy, we thought Jimbo Fisher might get that phone call to come back to Baton Rouge. Uh, that did not happen or it didn't work out whatever way that you think now he, he's sort of in concrete there. This is his place. I don't see him moving anywhere else. I and mean, help me from the inside there. That's how it feels to me. You know, I, I felt for a while that, uh, you know, really since Jimbo came, that LSU was probably – LSU and maybe Alabama uh, would be the jobs that he might be interested in leaving for. Uh, he's got a lot of ties to LSU. Uh, he obviously you know, had success there when he was there with Coach Saban. Um, and so for a long time, I, I felt like that was the place he would end up going to uh, if that opportunity came open, and certainly it did with Les Miles. And uh, I would have put money on – a good chance of him going. I, so I, I agree with you. I think if you don't take that job, uh, basically you're saying that the only job, I, to me, in my opinion, the only job I could ever see him leaving FSU for, for now at this point, unless things change dramatically, is the Alabama job. If, if, if that ever came open and they, they were interested in him, because, um, you, know, you know, to me, turning down LSU and what they could offer in terms of resources, uh, I think says that, you know, he believes he can do what he needs to do at Florida State. Uh, and that means they're going to have to step up in terms of resources, and he hasn't been shy about that. He he said at the uh, uh, he agreed to stay at FSU in December, and then at the pre Orange Bowl press conference, he actually said publicly that he's going to hold the administration to what they told him they would do. And I, I don't think there's anything in writing, but I think they've agreed to uh, pursue the facilities he wants to give him more staffing that he wants to kind of get up to the level that you know Alabama, Ohio State. Clemson, some of these schools are, are, are doing in terms of support staff and resources. And, uh, you know, he's going to be demanding of that kind of thing at Florida State. For him to stay, it makes, it makes me feel like there is some sort of commitment there from FSU. Iris Schofield right now from warchant.com right here inside uh, as we move forward talking about Florida State and Alabama. Ira, I want to go here just for a minute and sort of get your perspective. You're not going to hurt our feelings here at SEC Country. But do you see the ACC as passing up the SEC right now as the king of college football? You know, I think obviously they had a really good year last year. Um, but, I, you know, I, I, I think the ACC needs to kind of prove it over the long term. Uh, you know, I, I think um, where uh, I, I'm surprised by uh, how, how much the SEC quarterbacks have struggled. I'm really surprised by how the offenses have looked um, in the SEC, and they haven't really – 
uh, produce the elite quarterbacks. And I think that's the key where the ACC uh, the last year or two has really had nice quarterbacks and done a good job with those. Um, so I feel like the ACC last year could make that claim, uh, but I don't know. I, I kind of have to see it a little bit more of a long term. Now, I've been around, you know, I went to school in Florida, so I've, and I've, this is in the 80s, so I've seen it all kind of come full circle. I saw, you know, back when, you know, the SEC, the, you know, some of the teams in the SEC weren't all that great, and I saw the rise, and, and now we've seen it kind of step back. But I just think the resources that are at these SEC schools, the fan support, the number of students, the number of, of alumni, I just feel like they're gonna. That cycle is gonna come back. Uh, I just think the problem with the ACC is is probably always gonna be uh, they're gonna have a hard time getting the money that the SEC and Big Ten get just because of the television contracts and the small alumni bases and the fact that you know a lot of these can't, a lot of these schools you do have FSU you've got Clemson you've got Miami you've got Virginia Tech you've got some schools who are really committed to football but then you also have some smaller private schools that can't really make that commitment. And I think that's ultimately, over the long term, is going to be what kind of keeps the ACC back door a little bit. But, you know, I, I, I'm looking at it, and I understand that Nick Saban's at that number top. I, I give you that in the SEC. But when I look at quality head coaches, I see more quality in the ACC than I do in the SEC when I'm talking about head coaches. I think you're right. I mean, the, the ACC schools, and I think this was not an accident. I think uh, when the ACC, you know, John Swafford, the commissioner of the ACC, and the the leadership in the conference looked at the changing landscape and how much money uh, the SEC and Big Ten were bringing in for football and uh, the ACC was seen as a basketball league. Uh, I think that they put pressure on when they signed the long-term grant of rights agreement and all of that. Uh, I think they put pressure on these schools to, to invest more into football and to do a better job of hiring, identifying and hiring uh, top flight football coaches. And you're right. I think you, know, you look at Fuente and some of these guys that they've hired that there's no doubt they've got really good coaches i just think ultimately the challenge they're always going to have is just you know you, some of these schools with you know smaller stadiums smaller fan bases smaller alumni support i just don't know how they're going to keep up especially you know you look at the sec schools bringing 40 million dollars a year now 40 million plus the big 10 schools are going to be allegedly doing more than that and the acc i just don't know how they're going to ever close that gap and the longer that goes on you just wonder if they can sustain it 